Gatling in. Um, let's go ahead and start the recording. Okay, I wanted to thank everybody who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Delivering Cloud Native Application and Infrastructure Management. Uh, my name is Josh Burkus. I'm the Kubernetes Community Manager at Red Hat. Um, uh, and I'm a cloud native ambassador, um, in which context I'm hosting today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to welcome our presenter today, Matt Baldwin, who is director of cloud native and Kubernetes engineering at NetApp. So welcome, Matt. Thank you. Um, before we actually start, I wanted to give a few housekeeping items. Um, number one, during the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee and you will not be able to display your video. Um, instead, we have a Q&A panel. If you click the small Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, it will open up a separate panel where you can post questions, some of which will get answered in text messages uh, by the NetApp team who are dialed into this call, um, and some of which will get answered during the Q&A phase at the end of the presentation. Um, well, you can ask questions in chat. We may miss them. Um, so I really recommend asking the questions through that Q&A panel um, and not in the group chat. Uh, one other thing that I actually wanted to mention is that this is an official CNCF webinar and therefore it is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Um, so please do not put anything in chat um, or anything in your questions that would violate that code of conduct. Uh, which just really says be excellent to each other. And with that, I want to hand it over to Matt for today's presentation. So take it away, Matt. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I love the be excellent. Uh, can't wait for that movie to come out here. Uh, so like Josh said, I am Matt Baldwin. I'm the director of cloud native and Kubernetes engineering at NetApp. Um, prior to that, I was uh, founder and CEO of a company called Stackpoint Cloud. Um, and I too am a CNCF ambassador for Kubernetes and have been one for the last few years. Uh, so with uh, that real brief introduction, let me get moving on this. So, so where, are you, where are we here today for? Um, so first I'm gonna kind of take, you, take everybody through what is cloud native and kind of my thinking on uh, the definition of cloud native. And uh, I'm gonna go through the, the nice little cloud, cloud native trail map that CNCF has produced. Um, then I'm going to go through kind of some user persona definitions because uh, from, from my position, cloud native is about the users and about how are users consuming these systems. And, uh, and so I think, and I always think from the user point of view. Um, next, we'll move into cloud, what we're calling cloud native anywhere, which is a concept that you should be, you know, continuing the concept of portability with Kubernetes workload is that your cloud native environments and that, that workload on those environments should ultimately be able to run anywhere, regardless of on-premise or off-premise. And I'll show you some tooling of how that can work um, in the demo. Uh, after that, uh, I'll discuss a concept called cloud native app management of, so how do you uh, provide developers with what they need for uh, for the environments that they're shipping code into. Um, how do you take uh, how do you take you know kind of responsibility off the developer to need to understand things like Kubernetes, uh, understand things like Istio, and so they all they have to do is basically push code uh, to deploy basically push code to deploy their application into into a running environment. And so I'm going to talk through that uh, here uh, towards the end of the presentation and provide a demo as well. At, so let me get going with the cloud native definition. So this is a, I'm just gonna put the, I'm just gonna let the slide linger uh, here. I'm not gonna read out the definition. I'm sure you guys can read it. Uh, this is a, the definition as published by the CNCF. And effectively what it tries to do is try to cap, tries to capture what do we mean when we say cloud native? And you know, what we're, what I wanna zero in and on is that last statement in the last sentence, which is, uh, you know, Engineers need, will be able to do things with high impact changes frequently, be able to do high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toil. So that last phrase, minimal toil, is an interesting one for me because if you read the definition, to get to cloud native requires a lot of toil. So it takes a lot of toil to get to minimal toil so that you know, going forward, you could begin to do quick changes uh, frequently that you're able to do predictably. But to get into that, 
into that world uh, is going to take quite a bit of work. And uh, CNCF has published a, the na a cloud native trail map. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to call out, here's the you know, services solutions that you're going to need to look at, begin to adopt uh, on your journey to cloud native. And you know, just like, uh, like a trail you know, here in the Olympics uh, here in Seattle, um, trails can be dangerous. Trails can be hard. Uh, trails could be very long, and but at the end, we're trying to get to a point where it's minimal toil for everybody. So we're saying, you know, you're going to need some type of containerization. Uh, you're going to need orchestration uh, for pretty much all of us. That is Kubernetes. Uh, you know, you're going to need to be able to package those those applications up in some type of definition. Helm for most of us. Uh, how do I observe all of this? How do I do CI, CD? Uh, you know, what about network? What about service meshes? So, you know, do I need to use Istio? Am I looking at Linkerd? Um, and then we move into things like distributed databases and then storage. And so these are all pieces that end users uh, and operators are going to need to understand to assemble a cloud native uh, platform. And, you know, the intent is that we should drive towards a world where uh, these things are easier and easier to compose together that we don't need to have deep knowledge on Kubernetes to be able to run Kubernetes, that we don't need to have any knowledge of Istio to be able to actually leverage uh, features like Canaries or AD deployments or blue green type of deployments, that all of this should be easily composable for me as a user, that uh, I don't need to learn a lot of new things effectively is where I would like to head in the space. Because um, everybody has to learn new things now. You know, there's like a ton of stuff on everybody's plate. And from, you know, with customer interactions that we're seeing, uh, there's a lot of mandates coming down from, you know, now that Kubernetes is kind of out there, uh, cloud native is now circulating more in the mainstream. C-level, uh, C-suites are starting to catch wind of this technology. And we're hearing mandates are just being pushed down into teams. You know, things like, get us over to cloud native in six months uh, where that team has uh, zero knowledge of cloud native. And so you have six months to go from zero knowledge to being an expert in this, this entire trail map. Uh, so what we're trying to do at NetApp is try to deliver tooling that makes it easier to get down this, this trail. Uh, and I'm going to show some of that here in a bit. So what are some of the pillars that we try to stand on uh, when it comes to cloud native? Uh, the first pillar is the workload ultimately should always be portable. Uh, it should be ready for multi-cloud. Uh, you should uh, be abstracted from your cloud provider. You should be abstracted from your infrastructure. Um, because the idea is that you should be able to take that workload and I should be able to have that live on premise. I should be able to move that to say a public cloud provider. Um, my data should be able to come with me in that scenario. Uh, and these are some of these components are not things that are part of you know, Kubernetes directly, like Kubernetes doesn't account for moving data from point A to point B. You need extra tooling to be able to do that. Um, uh, things like cloud native application management is another pillar that we, we look at. And that is a way of thinking about how do you uh, deliver and run and manage um, applications inside of Kubernetes, not necessarily a deployment, but how do you take a group of deployments and create an application taxonomy around those and say, these deployments together represent my application. And as a developer, uh, so say I'm in a persona of a developer, I want to be able to see service dashboards for that uh, application. I want to be able to see logs for the application. I need to be able to quickly scale it. I need to be able to quickly iterate on it. Uh, and I don't really need, I don't really want to know a lot about Kubernetes to do so. Uh, so how do we arrive at that state? And so we're thinking around things like cloud native application management. And I'll dig into that a little deeper here in a bit. Um, another pillar that we're looking at with regards to cloud, a uh, full cloud native stack is uh, security. And the belief is that security needs to be, you need to have security at rest. Uh, so there's great open source tooling out there to be able to accomplish that. Uh, Anchor uh, comes to mind, which is a, a container scanner, a registry scanner. Um, it could be used in place of Claire, if anyone out there knows what Claire is. Um, also, we believe in container security at runtime. Uh, open source tools that would help you address that would be things like Falco uh, from Sysdig uh, would allow you to begin to address uh, runtime security and also uh, you know, forensics around uh, events that occur in that container. Um, and so we think 
you know, there needs to be a lot of the tooling out there. All of it needs to be open source, but there needs to be a way to tie all of this together so that you have a consistent user and management experience around these tools. Uh, the problem that most of the users, the space is having is what tools do I use and how do I assemble them all together so I have a cohesive, what we would call a cloud native stack of solutions to work with. Um, you know, how do I ensure that all my, you know, all my, you know, traffic inside my cluster is secure in flight, you know, how do I do that with Istio? Is that by default? You know, how do I visualize that? Uh, you know, there's a lot of that tooling that needs to be composed and put together for users. And that's what we're, uh, what we'll be showing you here. Um, storage is another big one. Uh, that's a cloud native pillar for us, uh, for sure, as NetApp. Uh, is how do you think about storage and inside the context of a microservice and running in Kubernetes? Um, how do you protect that storage? Uh, how do you move that, that data from uh, point A to point B? So how do you migrate to the public cloud if you're on-premise or if you're in the public cloud and want to move back to on-premise, how do you do that? How do you uh, replicate you know, production data into test workloads so that you can actually test against uh, real data. And so these are a lot of the things that we're thinking about when it comes to uh, cloud native storage and how we're beginning to expose cloud native storage inside of Kubernetes. Um, as NetApp, we actually do sit inside the SIG storage uh, and participate in that SIG with uh, contributions for things like snapshots and uh, tying, you know, uh, some of our technology into, into Kubernetes to be able to, um, you know, basically surface what we've invented over the last 20 plus years. Um, you know, things like deduplication, stuff like that. So we're very heavy into the storage side um, with the, you know, some of the other uh, momentum in app. We're moving, we're, you know, we're tying, kind of tying storage together with cloud native app management security. And then also we're thinking about managed data services. So how do you, um, how do you quickly get up and running with Kafka? You know, so how do you get, how do you leverage Confluence Kafka's operator? How do you get that under management? How do you get support for that? Uh, and then how do you just declare that you need that you, uh, in your environment? And that's some of the stuff that we've been working on as well. One of the last pillars that I think about is uh, personas. So when I approach the space, uh, I think about things like who are my who are my users and because you know I'm not thinking about the person who's going to pop the engine and disassemble the engine, but the actual users of like the broad market uh, of users. And so we're thinking broadly around people like what we call an operator, uh, what we would call classically a developer. Uh, then there's executive level. Uh, and so, you know, I'm starting to approach the space from a, uh, you know, how does an app developer think about Kubernetes and how, what tooling would they wish to use? Uh, and so my hope is that some of the demo that I show will, will map to, to those answers. This slide kind of digs deeper into defining these, these personas. Uh, operators would have different titles. You know, these are people who could be an IT manager. They could be a system admin, uh, you know, the new kind of, SREs, a new new term coming out. Uh, not all enterprises are aware of what an SRE is. Uh, I think it's very important as cloud native uh, proponents that we are, that we we break out of a myopic view of the cloud native space right now uh, and understand that most of the enterprise world, uh, we're talking these like G100 size customers. Um, most of these customers don't really understand some of these new roles. They don't uh, know what an SRE is. They don't, uh, some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them are very early in their cloud native journey uh, to the point where they're just beginning to containerize. Some of them are very, very far along in their journey. Um, but the intent of the operator role persona is, you know, people who are managing this cloud native infrastructure who have to maintain it on day two um, you know, who have to, you know, manage the resources that their developers are consuming. Then on the flip side, we do have the developers and these are, you know, individual contributors uh, inside the company. They have different titles like software engineer, software developer, developer. Uh, some people call these guys, will assign a DevOps lead role to them if, if your shop goes down the path of having uh, titles for DevOps. Uh, so we do see a lot of this type, these types of personas in the markets and kind of just going back to the my myopic idea. Um, I think there's this intent inside of cloud native that we want to solve all of these problems 
uh, for users and we want to have users begin to build, you know, all your apps need to be greenfield, all your apps need to be microservices and you need to consume and be monitoring things with Prometheus. Oh, you need to use Elasticsearch Fluentd Kibana. Uh, and when you sit down with large organizations and you say that to them, they have may have 20 to 30,000 applications that are already running. Uh, and so the, the journey is not easy for uh, organizations adopting this technology and the journey isn't uh it doesn't have minimal toil at the moment so what we're trying to do with netapps tooling is uh, try to get you quickly to minimal toil so that you don't have to worry about uh, most of that trail map that that trail map is um, done for you effectively so this leads me into the kind of the cloud native anywhere concept which is uh you should be able to have uh your your infrastructure should be able to be maintained and managed uh, regardless of anywhere it's at. So your experience should always be the same of managing Kubernetes on say Amazon, should be identical to how you manage Kubernetes on top of Google, uh, to how you manage Kubernetes on top of say VMware on premise. And you know where uh, the concept should always be the same as well. So if you're thinking about things like node pools, uh, conceptually the, the idea of node pool should be the same with on-premise VMware as it is with public cloud Amazon. Um, also, I believe that uh, cloud native anywhere also implies that it should always be multi-cloud ready. And there's a lot of argument around what we could define as multi-cloud. Uh, I would define multi-cloud as you're doing business with two different providers, uh, or you may have an on-prem environment, uh, but you are using at least two different uh, classically cl infrastructure, cloud infrastructure platforms, be that of on-premise VMware, or that is Amazon, or that's Azure and Amazon. Um, we're, I'm not currently seeing too many users, at enterprises spanning workload across uh, where they split applications between, uh, you know, say Azure and Amazon. More than anything, what I'm starting to see is customers have multiple accounts with multiple providers and then they have failover at those providers or they have some of their services deployed on X and some of their services deployed on Y. Um, and that's where we're seeing kind of starting to see multi-cloud go. But the end cloud native, uh, she, you should be able to manage that environment in an identical way, regardless of where it's running. Um, you know, it's about life cycle of that infrastructure. So not just life cycle of Kubernetes, but life cycle of the host nodes themselves, life cycle of if you're running serv a service mesh like Istio, how, what's the life cycle of that? Um, also, how do you life cycle your own applications running on top of this environment? And so we need tooling that helps us uh, make that easy and brings that, uh, you know, kind of brings in that complexity for us. Um, and then we also want to be able to manage access across all of this so that when I add a team and I add users to that team and grant those that team access to, say, a cluster or a namespace in a cluster, that that flows down to a cluster and that I can do that across I can grant a, a team access to one cluster uh, or one namespace, multiple namespaces or multiple clusters or multiple namespaces across multiple clusters. And I need an easy way of doing that, an easy way of visualizing that. Lastly, I need to be able to scale in the same way, either on-prem or off-prem. Uh, so how do I do auto, uh, you know, automatic node, uh, cluster node scaling? Um, you know, how do we accomplish you know, HA on-premise, off-premise, uh, things like that. So what do we mean in context of NetApp when we start to talk about that? Uh, so within our tooling, uh, what we mean is support between Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, uh, and then on-premise for things like uh, HCI, generalized VMware, and FlexPod. And then we also, when, we, when I've been talking about day one, day two type of operations and day zero operations, uh, one thing that I've started to run into is people tend to start to argue about like what happens on it, you know, like kind of like there's some gray area uh, with some some end users. So I've been starting to define this as just any day ops, as in your tooling needs to be able to support you not on just standing up the cluster, uh, but you need to be able to do ongoing management of that cluster. You need to be able to visualize workload in that cluster. You need to be able to visualize load uh, logs, things like that. You need to be able to upgrade that cluster. You need to be able to rotate the certificates in the cluster um, and and you also should be able to manage things like Prometheus on top of that. You should be able to manage things like Service Mesh on top of that. Uh, so I try not to parse day one, day two, day zero type of conversation, and I just call it all any day ops. Um, 
you also should be able to manage service mesh easily. Developers shouldn't need to learn how to write a traffic management rule. So the intent with tooling is it should make it so easy that a developer can easily just pick up the tool and create a canary uh, and you know just say I have service A and service B and I want to run a canary with service B and I want to pass 1% of my egress traffic to that canary um, or I wish to do blue green or I want to do an AB and the intent of the type of tooling that we've been building is to uh, remove the need for that type of knowledge from the developer so that they just say give me a canary and then the system manages the rules for them behind the scenes. Uh, you also need tooling that makes it easier to manage RBAC, uh, so role-based controls for users and teams. Uh, tooling that ties together GPU support with you know, regular CPU instances. Um, and then tooling that takes you from being able to scale from a POC to a high availability cluster. Uh, so you know, some tools out there you know, are great for uh, you know, just quickly standing up cluster if you want to start to play with it. But if you need to begin to be able to do ongoing management of say etcd or uh, the masters then that it starts to fall apart and so the intent is to create tooling that allows you to easily do all that uh easily go from you know i want to have a test cluster but i you know maybe i want to scale that out to a production cluster and then lastly things like private topology uh, which is the idea that there's in a public cloud setup that you don't have anything like a public IP attached to any of those nodes that you're coming in through a bastion host. And that should always, uh, you know, our belief is that, you know, all clusters should be built as private topologies uh, that you shouldn't have, you know, public inbound access directly to that cluster unless that's exposed to a load balancer. Um, you know, then we get into weird problems like developers declaring uh, a load balancer without the IT team under knowing that that's happening and then you can actually expose uh, a security issue by that by doing that. Um, so we try to look for things like that in, in our solution. So with that, let me go ahead and just do a quick demo of what I'm talking about with the tooling. Uh, so Josh, I'm going to ask you if you see the screen here. So I assume you can see the screen. Um, yeah, so this, this is a, a browser screen. Yes, yes. Yep, it's coming through clear. So this is uh, a tool that you can uh, go and just uh, sign up for. Uh, just sign up through, it's a SaaS-based tool uh, that is, uh, some of them people might recognize this as the old Stackpoint uh, IO tool. Um, it's the same thing, uh, just renamed. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an easy way to uh, basically get cluster inf infrastructure up and running. Um, or be able to do you know, day two type operations. And so here I've got a list view of you know, clusters running on each of the cloud providers. I can dig in and I can actually manage them if I wanted to. Uh, I can see liveness probes. Uh, so these, all the green dots indicate that those nodes are online. This is a POC cluster. Uh, if I wanted to, I could actually scale the cluster and begin to add, you know, uh, I can go up to two more masters, so I can have three, and then etcd is managed behind the scenes, uh, and then move up to five nodes, masters, and then you have five etcd uh, members as well. Um, then what we're trying to do here is make the tooling so that when you say, I want node pools, that when you create a node pool on Amazon, you can actually just replicate and create that same node pool on, uh, say, GCP, or on Azure, or on VMware. Uh, the idea is that you can also come in here and do quick upgrades uh, so that we're making, you, so you don't need to worry about CLEs or command line tools. Uh, we don't, you know, this isn't, you know, you, we're not replacing kubectl. Uh, kubectl works fine with, with, you know, these clusters. These are all upstream um, clusters. We don't, we're not a fork. We're not doing anything like that. But an upgrade is just as simple as choosing, you know, I want to move up to 1.15.3 uh, with this cluster. And then it does, it basically performs an in-place upgrade. Um, we try to make it, you know, we try to do things where we're saying, hey, you can still use, you know, tooling that comes with the project. And so we want to be able to say, hey, you can use uh, the Kubernetes dashboard, but we don't want to expose that dashboard to the public internet. So what we do is we tunnel it through our, our tooling so that you can just, you know, get access to it. Um, but what we're trying to say is we're trying to say we don't really, you know, we try not to create a fork of these clusters so that you have a unique way of managing it if you're a NetApp customer. We don't want you just to be a NetApp customer. We want you to be a Kubernetes user. Uh, the end goal is that we want to make it easy for you to manage Kubernetes. Um, 
you know, you don't have to purchase storage or anything like that from NetApp to do this. Um, this is uh, the wizard uh, that makes it easy. You know, it's a three-step wizard that allows you to create a cluster. Uh, we, you know, you just basically walk through the wizard and at the end of it, uh, we ask you one more question of if you want to, you know, do you want to make any changes to this? If not, once you click submit, it begins to build, uh, build a cluster on premise. The VMware experience that we have is also identical to, uh, to our, um, our pub, the public cloud experience. So this is where we're trying to say, we, we believe in harmony of managing cloud infrastructure, regardless of where that's running. And so the idea with the tooling also is to walk through through three step process and you have a cluster running on your VMware environment. Uh, if you have a FlexPod environment, three step process, and now you have FlexPod, a cluster running on top of a FlexPod environment. Um, you can also have an Amazon cluster running alongside that as well. Um, so that's the, the quick demo of the, the cluster infrastructure side of this. Um, and, but what about our developers? So that whole scenario was, you know, I'm a IT operator type of person. I need to create infrastructure. I need to manage infrastructure. Um, but now I'm a developer and, you know, what if, you know, what I want to be able to do. So I want to be able to push code and I want to be able to, you know, uh, I just want to do a git commit and then now my, my application's up and running inside of Kubernetes. So in this next, so let me talk through what we mean when we start to talk about uh, cloud native app management. So what we think is it should be a Git based app deployment model. Uh, so that, and it should be able to support, you should be able to use this tooling to run against both on-premise clusters and off-premise clusters. So public cloud clusters. Um, it should be all built on top of open source tooling. So we, uh, we implement uh, our own set of controllers and CRDs on top of uh, things like Tecton and Knative, uh, it's just to let everybody know. And, but like at no point do we want to build custom tooling, cu custom components that make all this possible. What we're trying to say is we're gluing it all together. We're composing that entire cloud native road uh, trail map for you so that you don't actually have to think through that trail map. Let us do all that, that tooling and manage it all for you. Uh, it's just to try to get you to minimal toil as quickly as possible. Um, so in our concept of app management, we have uh, an idea of projects and a project is a, a maps to a tenant of the namespace inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we provide tooling that allows you to set resource quotas and limits on that project so that, uh, you know, whatever users are deploying into that project um, are capped and we allow you to tie teams of users to that project and then flow that team down to Kubernetes RBAC so that uh, that team could subsequently log in and pull down a kube config file to attach that namespace. Um, you know, we also believe in this idea that you have a choose your own adventure with how you want to deploy workload into, into the cluster. Um, you know, there's the standard kube cuddle, uh, kube, kube cuddle apply my YAML to my running environment. Cool, I have it all online or I'm using Helm to do a, a Helm install of a Helm chart into my environment, um, or I'm, I wanna be able to do a git commit and uh, then see my application come up inside the environment, or I'm gonna do a git commit on a change and see that change come online in the environment. Um, I wanna be able to life cycle this application, so I should be able to upgrade this. You know, I should be able to see metrics attached to this application, so I should have service dashboards. I should be able to see logs if I'm outputting logs to standard out. I should be able to see that. Um, and uh, the other idea is that we wanna make it easy for, as easy as a developer when they were working with Heroku, that Kubernetes becomes that simple to work with as a developer. It's, 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 a, it's a Heroku like experience, um, but a little bit further than where Heroku left off. Um, you know, also, we want to make sure that IT teams can manage the auto scaling for applications that are developers pushing into the environments without the developers having to worry about those, uh, those management settings. So, where are you going to see? So I'm going to show you uh, the concept of the projects, uh, the solutions that we place into those projects, uh, and the kind of the dashboards for things like metrics. And then I'm going to do a demo of uh, delivering it through Git. So a project is uh, basically a bucket. It's a namespace. Uh, 
our thinking is that you're going to be working a single project. Uh, you know, that would be an application. So this is the taxonomy here for, for an app. Um, WordPress is an example I've been using uh, to describe, you know, WordPress has multiple components to an end user. Uh, WordPress is the application, but behind the scenes, you have my, my SQL, you have a front end, um, and you maybe have some other components, but the idea is that a project would contain all of that. Um, the project would also have RBAC protection. Um, and it would have default network policy, uh, so services don't communicate outside of that namespace. Uh, and it would have quotas and limits if, if the uh, IT operator wanted to apply those. Um, solutions, uh, the concept here is the tooling allows you to uh, deploy a solution uh, into your Kubernetes cluster in uh, three different ways. Tracker being uh, how we support, you know, bring your own tooling. So like kubectl, uh, Git workflow, which is how do you, you know, do continue to use Git to manage your workload, and then uh, a way of deploying Helm to the environment, Helm charts into the environment. Uh, and we actually never required Tiller. Uh, and with with this solution, uh, we, re we replaced Tiller. Um, we understand that with Helm 3, Tiller is gone. Uh, but, you know, until Helm 3 is fully out, we're not going to adopt yet. Um, also things like, you know, applying default pod security policies to, uh, to that namespace. So when pods come online, that they inherit, a, they, they get a, a particular pod security policy. And then also how do you alert on, on, you know, does that pod security policy align with ICIS benchmarks? And so let me go ahead and uh, do a quick demo of, of this piece here. So, so here I have a, um, so going, kind of going back to the idea of simplicity, um, we're trying to pro provide with this tooling just a simple dashboards for you to see um, what is the health of my clusters, what are the health, what is the health of my projects, uh, and what are some average you know, you know metrics coming off these things, you know so like my average CPU and my average memory across all my clusters, and so this is all real time, and so we're saying you know two projects and all the objects inside of those namespaces are online. You know, we allow you to dig deeper into this and start to uh, kind of break them down and say, I want, you know, I can start to see what's my CPU core and memory usage for uh, a particular project that I'm working in. So this is my new app. I'm running it on Amazon. Everything is online. And then we start to show uh, deeper details once you dig into it. And we show memory, CPU usage, disk and network uh, IO pressure. And then we kind of tell you quick numbers like total number of pods, total number of deployments, what's network traffic in and out looking like, and then what deploy, uh, what solutions do you have deployed inside of this environment. Um, and then kind of just quickly highlight how those three components I was talking about work. We've made it simpler, simple to use the tooling to uh, take advantage of those components. So tracker, uh, again, is something if I'm going to apply uh, put my own workload into the environment, I could come into uh, this piece of the tooling and add a, say I'm running, this is the label I'm using. I'm using, you know, app uh, test is my label. So go ahead and when I create this tracker, then our controllers will watch for your, your applicate, your solution in the environment, and they'll pull it all together inside of this view so that when you come back into the app, you'd actually be able to see metrics and logs for uh, that YAML that you deployed onto the environment. Um, the other idea is, you know, very simple, like marketplaces. Here's, I'm just showing the Bitnami uh, marketplace where, you know, we have the capacity to ingest Helm repos either from public or private repositories. And this is actually, I've set it up to just ingest the Bitnami uh, market, uh, Bitnami chart marketplace into my private accounts so that I have a private marketplace as my user logged into into this into this uh, system versus other users, um, we also provide things like trusted charts that we've gone through and verified. And so this is one way you know you deploy these into the environment, and it, you would also again see uh, kind of metrics dashboard and logging dashboards for that. And I have Redis deployed right here. Um, the last way of doing this is what we call uh, Git workflow, which is you know. What, what I'm doing here is I'm an IT manager and I want to create a custom application. You know, my new team's app that they're working on 
uh, you know, I want to make sure that they're going to have a rolling update strategy for the application once they deploy it into the environment through Git. Uh, I want to make sure that there's always, you know, five replicas for them and they can max to 15. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and trigger on 70% CPU utilization. And when I create this application, this is going to create just a very small number of objects inside of the, uh, inside of the Kubernetes cluster. And then uh, what we have a controller that's going to watch for uh, when you do the first Git push. And then once that happens, we build a deployment around the container that, so we build a container off of that Git push, and then we wrap that container up as a deployment, and then we bring that, uh, put that under management inside of, uh, by our controller, and then our controller effectively turns on things like horizontal pod auto scaling and takes the values that you've set here uh, for that. Um, so I already have that deployed right here. And the other thing that we do is we give you kind of a quick dashboard, uh, sorry, not a dashboard, but a vanity uh, URL that you can check uh, so that when you make a change, you can go ahead and say, cool, this is what my, my app looks like. Um, so I have, hold on, let me, I'm gonna just go make a quick change. And, and again, And then what I'm doing here is I just made a change and now I am uh, effectively rebuilding that deployment, that container and uh, doing a rolling upgrade uh, out into the environment to uh, basically get that new change out there. And so um, over time, you'll see things like an error will show up as pods are coming online. Uh, and then eventually that is now up and running. So the developer was able to so I was able to make a change, push it real quick, and have it up and running in the environment. It takes about two to three minutes for that to happen. Um, you know, another aspect of what we do is we uh, provide, uh, you know, ease. So we're all about UI and user usability, as you, as hopefully as you can see. So we also have, uh, you know, I'm not going to jump into the demo of this, but we have usability around. Uh, the CNCF Harbor project as well. So everything that we use here is open source. And uh, so that is how we've built our tooling is off of, uh, is by leveraging open source and tying it together. Uh, and so we've been doing a lot of work inside of the Harbor project as well to um, create a, a better managed experience for how you manage Harbor inside of like a context like this. So, you know, when I do a git commit, and that container starts to be built, I want to be able to target my Harbor registry inside of my service cluster for it to be stored there. I want to be able to use things like Anchor to lock down uh, policy, you know, lock down those containers inside of Harbor so that when uh, a CVE, uh, you know, there's a CVE that is reported for one of the containers, that there's a policy that does not allow that container to be pulled out into to runtime. And so we do have tooling, uh, so we do have usability around that right now uh, in this, but I, I don't have a demo prepared for that. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back to you, Josh. I'm ready for Q and A. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, I'm I as a reminder, everybody, there is a question and answer panel um, in I uh, uh, which you can access by clicking on the Q and A icon. You can ask your questions. Um, and I will queue them um, and share them with the presenter. Um, um, well, we're waiting for those to queue up. Um, I'll start with one of my own. Um, so, um, and I'm answering some of these. Uh, through the chat, I guess, right? So what, uh, I'll, 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 do you want me to just read down the list? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so one of the questions was uh, about downgrades of Kubernetes clusters and we don't, uh, so we don't currently account for that. Um, you know, we've, so our history with upgrades, so we've been supporting Kubernetes upgrades since 1.11 uh, and so, for us, it's been difficult to uh, kind of support downgrade. Uh, now that we move moving into more of a standardized way of doing uh, cluster builds, Kubadium is, is what we would use behind the scenes. Um, we would look at being able to support that, but right now we don't. Yeah, and actually one of the things I'll add to that is um, 
one of the things we have going on in the Kubernetes community is that currently nobody is maintaining the end-to-end -end test for downgrade. Um, so officially as the Kubernetes project, we don't have any official support for downgrading. And if that's a use case that matters to you, um, you might want to think about having some of your QE engineers contribute to the project so that it's something that we can actually test at the upstream level. Yeah, I think what the pattern that we're seeing is that um, customers, like a lot of the enterprise, a lot larger customers are starting to just run uh, one or two versions behind on Kubernetes um, versus, you know, jumping into the new version each time it ships. Uh, and I think that's going to become a more of a persistent story that we're going to have most, most enterprises going to run at uh, a version or two behind. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's a question from Howard Drew. Um, are multi-cloud builds a security concern? Um, is um, MFA, IM, and uh, encryption enough? I would like to ask to clarify that question. What do you mean by... Um, I, I guess I, I want a little bit more clarity on that question. Yeah, okay. So, Howard, if you can actually retype your question in the Q&A panel, we'll pick it up in a minute. Uh, in the meantime, let's go on to Dennis's question. Uh, no, that was Dennis with the downgrade. Uh, there's a second question, which is um, the UI tool and everything you just demonstrated, is this open source? So some of our components are open source and some of it are just free to use. Uh, so you can just go and log in and trial the, the UI tooling itself. Um, and then we have other open source components as well that we have on our GitHub repo. Okay. Um, like all uh, of our, uh, like if you're interested in some of the storage work that we're doing behind the scenes in that tool, uh, that's an open source project that's called Trident. Uh, and that's uh, basically how we're doing, how, solving storage inside of Kubernetes. Okay. Um, the, um, uh, another question from, uh, Bo Button, uh, what kind of support, uh, comes with the service? Uh, presumably the, the commercial version. Yeah. With the commercial version, uh, NetApp is selling, I, I guess we we're selling, um, enterprise support with that. So it's bundled in with the, the commercial version. So there's, you don't have to basically with the commercial version, you don't have to pay for support. You get the same level of support that NetApp's provided to its storage customers. So 24 seven, 365, uh, same, uh, from a Kubernetes point of view, same level of support that you would get from Red Hat. Okay. Um, another question. I uh, can, can we host this entire system ourselves? Uh, no, no. Okay. Um, I actually have another question. I have a question for you uh, out of out of mine, which is um, you're doing federation with this um, for multi-cloud um, and maybe uh, hybrid. Um, what's the underlying federation mechanism you're using? Are you using Kubernetes federation, federation v2, or using something developed by NetApp? So we, so federation is a touchy topic, as you can imagine in the space. Uh, we we originally we supported Federation V1, um, and we worked with Google actually to enable to ensure that support. Uh, but because V1 is now kind of into life, and V2 is kind of uh, kind of a shit show at the moment, uh, we are kind of taking the approach of writing our, some of our own IP and leveraging Istio as well, kind of coupling our own IP that we're combining with Istio, and then propose, sending proposals up to the Istio community on things uh, like uh, MCP. Um, so how do we, you know, so with our, how we federate between the two clusters now uh, is using some IP that we wrote that we're, uh, that we just sent upstream, which is uh, how do you connect two Istio service meshes together? Um, and then how you route traffic between those two. So that's how we're doing it is I would say, TLDR, uh, a bit of custom IP combined with Istio, but all that custom IP is open sourced. Okay. Um, so one questioner asked if you have plans to work with IBM and Red yes. Hat. Um, I, I mean, I would say actually already working with Red Hat, <laughs> but the, um, uh, cause we've collaborated with you guys on stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, the, um, uh, the the question I guess would be on what particular because um, we all collaborate a lot on Istio, um, I know. Uh, um, 
where we're looking at uh, our collaboration inside of the Istio world is MCP multi-cluster, uh, the multi-cluster pr protocol is what we're focused in looking at. Uh, with broadly with IBM though, uh, we're also uh, talking about being able to support IBM cloud. But I know with Red Hat, we, we do a lot of different work with Red Hat. So uh, it depends on the area of, of Red Hat. Yeah. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm getting some clarification on another question. I, so uh, Luis Sanchez actually asked a question. I'm going to actually paraphrase Luis's question um, to make it more applicable to the presentation, which is um, if somebody is just getting started with Kubernetes, um, would you recommend that they get started with um, a system uh, like this one with Stackpoint and Trident and that sort of thing, um, or that they get started with something like a bare bones, you know, upstream Kubernetes distro? I, you know, I, I think it, one, it depends on where, what your area of, ex, where you want to place your area of expertise. If it's just about, I want to learn how to deploy and run microservices on top of Kubernetes, because I want to learn this whole, mm -hmm. how do I refactor my application to run in this world? Uh, I don't want to be probably an IT manager of this platform. Mm -hmm. So I would use a tool like ours. I would use, you know, GKE, maybe, you know, like, ask Google for a $200 uh, gift card, you know, like not gift card, $200 credit, and they'll give you one. And then you just spin up GKE and then play around with, uh, you know, workload there. Um, you can plug that into ours as well, play, you know, uh, and then like with ours, you'd be able to play with more than just Kubernetes. You'd be able to use Istio and get experience with things like Prometheus and all that other stuff. Uh, but if you want strictly Kubernetes, uh, I feel like Google with GKE and their $200 credits might be a quick way for a newbie to get going. Um, without having to spend any money. Um, outside of that, you know, you're going to be spending a bit of money, not a lot, a lot of money, but a POC cluster would cost you, you know, something at all the providers. Yep. Okay. If you wanted to go the hard route, we, I would, uh, you know, persistently recommend the Kelsey Hightower document. Yeah. Um, one more uh, uh, question from outside the Q&A, um, and then we'll wind it up. Um, so Helm 3 has been released in beta. Have you played with it yet? Do you have thoughts? <laughs> um, a lot of thoughts around Helm. Uh, so we, we are, where we took our tooling is where Helm went with 3.0. Um, so our, where our pain is going to come in is we're going to have to refactor some of the tooling to account for Helm 3.0 because we were dealing with Helm 2.0. And we actually replaced the need for tiller in the environment on 2.0. And I would say that would be the biggest thing with 3.0 is the re re removal of 3.0. Yeah. But as okay. a, you know, as a packaging format in general, I think it can still stand some work. But we're okay. we're attending we're at Helm Summit this in in a few weeks, you know. So we're we're attending, you know, and trying to participate there as well. Okay, so one last question, and then we'll wind up, um, which is um, the Kubernetes upgrade through um, uh, the uh, orchestration tool. Is that a rolling upgrade? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I also see uh, roadmap support for clusters in other cloud by Oracle and IBM are on the way. Okay. Okay. Um, and I apologize for the construction I had in the background. Okay. okay. Um, I think that's everything. Um, the, um, okay. Well, thank you very much for a terrific presentation. Um, per the chat, um, the recording, the webinar, and the slides will be posted shortly in the CNCF um, events page um, on the webinars page. So if you can review any material, if you missed something as part of this presentation. And once again, thank you, Matt, for sharing and demonstrating that with us. You're welcome. Yeah. And if anyone, feel free to DM me on Twitter if you have any questions. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.